good morning, everybody. My voice is sore from singing some of them songs. Woo! Put my back into it. If you have your Bibles, let's turn to Psalm 49 for our reading this morning. I'm pretty sure this is where we left off. It's great to be back with everybody. Um, we had the opportunity of seeing a uh, couple churches while we were gone on the Lord's Day. And, uh, you know, it's always nice to, to meet new saints from around the world, but there's, there's nothing quite like coming back to your own uh, home assembly of the Lord. Psalm 49 is where we'll be at this morning. I'll be reading out of the ESV. If you want to read along in the ESV, that's what the little blue books around are. If you want to read along in whatever translation you have, that's fine too. Uh, we're going to be in Psalm 49 loudly victoriously, beginning in verse 1. Hear this, all peoples. Give ear, all inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor together. My mouth shall speak wisdom. The meditation of my heart shall be understanding. I will incline my ear to a proverb. I will solve my riddle to the music of the lyre. Why should I fear in times of trouble? When the iniquity of those who cheat me surrounds me, those who trust in their wealth and boast in the abundance of their riches, truly no man can ransom another or give to God the price of his life, for the ransom of their life is costly and can never suffice, that he should live on forever and never see the pit. For he sees that even the wise die, the fool and the stupid alike must perish, and leave their wealth to others. Their graves are their homes forever, their dwelling places to all generations. Though they called lands by their own names, man and his pomp will not remain. He is like the beasts that perish. This is the path of those who have foolish confidence, yet after them people approve of their boasts. Like sheep they are appointed for Sheol. Death shall be their shepherd, and the upright shall rule over them in the morning. Their form shall be consumed in Sheol with no place to dwell. But God will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol, for he will receive me. Be not afraid when a man becomes rich, when the glory of his house increases. For when he dies, he will carry nothing away. His glory will not go down after him. For though while he lives, he counts himself blessed. And though you get praise when you do well for yourself. His soul will go to the generation of his fathers, who will never again see life. Man in his pomp, yet without understanding, is like the beasts that perish. One of those seeker-sensitive psalms. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the truth of your word, uh, the comfort and the clarity that it brings to the Christian. We pray uh, that as we go into studying your word and expositing it, and applying it to our lives, that your spirit would honor our efforts, would be with us daily, would conform us to the image of Christ, and equip us for everything that you've called us to do. It's in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to be continuing where we left off with our study of the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 7, beginning in verse 24 and going down through the end of the chapter in verse 29. Look at us, making good progress. We're already almost done with chapter 7, and it's only been like six months, something like that. <laughs> a couple months. So, yeah, we're, we're moving. We're moving at a pace. Uh, whether it's a slow pace, or it's a pace. Uh, Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 24, and if you're able, ask the congregation to stand for the reading of God's word. Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 24, these are the words of the Lord. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain fell and the floods came. And the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowd 
crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. These are the words of the Lord. You may be seated. So as we go into uh, looking at this passage, there's a section from the Old Testament that I wanted us to read. Uh, it's in Daniel chapter 3. If you wouldn't mind turning to Daniel chapter 3 with me. Um, one of the things that we try to do as we go through these teachings of Christ, where he gives um, principal teachings, is to look at stories from the Old and New Testament where those principles are lived out. So Daniel chapter 3 is... Hopefully a familiar passage to you, especially if you grew up on Veggie Tales. This one is like one of the best Veggie Tales. I'll just leave it at that. Uh, but this is the story of uh, Nebuchadnezzar's golden image. So uh, the Jewish people are now in exile, uh, as Jeremiah had predicted. And so King Nebuchadnezzar is about to do something that's very problematic for three of God's people, uh, whose names we will get to in a moment. The so Daniel chapter 3 I want to just kind of read you to the story, and then we're going to kind of make some application from it. it. begins in verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, whose height was 60 cubits, and its breadth 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura, in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be immediately cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever! You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, the pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Well, there are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. The Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Just pause and think about that for a second. <laughs> Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. <laughs> if this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated, and he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. And then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning fiery furnace. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace was overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, 
Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, But I see four men, unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace, and he declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, <laughs> come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire, and the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed, their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own. Therefore I make a decree. He's fond of these decrees. Any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, <laughs> and their house is laid in ruins, for there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the province of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar was fond of these uh, hasty decrees. He was kind of a, uh, a hot-headed guy. But what we can tell, um, I think one thing that should stand out to us more than it probably does, is not that there were three men who stood up, but that there were only three men in all of the God's covenant people that stood up. They had heard the words of Jeremiah. They had heard the words of Isaiah. They had heard the words of Ezekiel. They had, they had had the Torah. They had the law. They knew what was right. And only three of them said, no, we will not do that. Even after the time that they had spent in Babylon and before that under the, the corrupt kings in Israel, uh, these three men were convinced that this was wrong because they were rooted in an authority structure that was transcendent above all earthly kings and kingdoms. And so when the flood, you might say, of Nebuchadnezzar's decrees came upon them, they weren't dismayed. They were certain. They were resolved. Come what may. I mean, look at their response in verse 16. <laughs> they answer, we have no need to answer you in this matter. <laughs> no, <laughs> we're not going to even answer you, okay? <laughs> if this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Oh, that we have no need. You can question us all you want. We do not have a need to respond to you. God is stronger than you. But even if he doesn't save us from you, we're still not going to bend the knee. Because you're still going to have to answer to him, O king. It's kind of easy, I think, looking back on these guys and think, yeah, we would have been like standing up with them. We wouldn't have been bound down to the, the statue. It's a lot harder uh, to, to do that when you don't necessarily have the hindsight of what God is going to do. Uh, there are thousands of examples of, of saints, especially in Christianity, who followed after their example and were not rescued from the fire, at least physically. One classical example of this is Ignatius of Antioch. You hear me talk about Ignatius all the time. He's an early 2nd century Christian. He writes his letters around the year 107 AD as he's on his way to Rome to be thrown to beasts in the Colosseum. And so he writes a letter. One of the letters is to the Romans where he's going. And this is what he says in the letter. Now I am beginning to be a disciple. May not of things visible and things invisible envy me that I may attain unto Jesus Christ. Come fire and cross and grapplings with wild beasts, cuttings and manglings, wrenching of bones, packing of limbs, crushings of my whole body. Come cruel tortures of the devil to assail me. Only be it mine to attain unto Jesus Christ. What a passage. This dude could write. He was rooted firmly in something that transcended all earthly authority and all earthly power. So all this is to say we're not the first generation of saints, either in the Old Testament or the New Testament, to bear the command to hold fast to the word of God. 
fact, we have it far easier than so many of them have before us. So keeping that in mind, let's go to Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 24. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. The first verse of our passage, Jesus says, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Now, I just want to point out to you what I think are the three most important words here. He starts with, everyone then who hears these words of mine, then he says this, and does them. It does us no good to open it up and go, wow, those are some really pretty words. I just love the, the poetry style. The literary style is just so, so pretty. It's so nice. Yep, put it back up and then don't change anything. That does no good. That's what Christ is talking about here. If that's all we do, it does us no good. If we truly hear and understand the gospel and the word of God, we will obey it. We cannot separate Jesus from his word, and he cannot be our Savior if he is not also our Lord. And if he's our Lord, if he's the Lord of our lives, that means we are not. We cannot love the Lord if we don't obey him. Jesus said this very thing in John 14. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And just earlier in Matthew chapter 7, he said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Now, make no mistake, we do not believe that our works are what earn us into heaven. The Bible is clear on that. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, not of our own works. It's a gift of God. But true saving faith is never without obedience. It's never without a changed life. James says this in chapter 2. He says, So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Faith without works is dead. If we have received a living, true, saving faith, it will show itself through our changed lives. If we are his sheep, we will hear his voice. One of the chief ways this living faith makes itself known in our Christian walk is in our eternal security, something that the world does not have. Look at verse 25. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. When we were on our trip, we had the great opportunity to stay with some of Jody's friends, David and Victoria Lawson, and they live in South Carolina. And uh, they're very involved with their church. David uh, leads the worship there, and they just recently went through the loss of their infant son. And you would expect, when you go into that type of environment, that there's going to be a lot of grief and, and a lot of depression. I mean, how could there not be? Yet when we went to their house, and we stayed there three nights, that was one of the most joyous homes that I'd ever been in because they're rooted and grounded in an authority structure in a value system that transcends everything the devil and that this world can throw at them it gives them a confidence A. that they'll see their son again and B. that their whole family whether here or in heaven or partially with both is held in the hands of Jesus. And they know that because they're rooted on his word. There is a firm foundation to the Christian that the world cannot shake. We grieve, but not without hope. We suffer, but not meaninglessly. We work hard, but not fruitlessly. And we die, but we enter into glory. Nothing the world has can give that peace because it's a peace that passes all understanding. Everything the world offers is a fragile and a counterfeit and a lie. Look at the next two verses. Jesus says just this. And everyone who hears these words of mine, so they hear the word, and does not do them, will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house. And it fell, and great was the fall of it. I don't think I need to convince anybody that the secular world around us is not doing well at the moment. The suicide rate continues to climb. We 
people are murdering their children in the womb. Adultery and pornography are everywhere. The government allows their own people to be invaded. It's not going well for people who reject the authority of God's word. Both individually and collectively, our nation has heard the word of the Lord. There's no absence of it being heard. They've ignored it. So it shouldn't surprise us to see all of the, the secular institutions around this crumbling. We should expect that. They have a foundation of sand. You cannot build anything lasting on a foundation sand. And those who heard Jesus' words when he spoke them uh, lived in a similar situation. You had followers of Christ who had heard and who had obeyed, living alongside the Jewish leadership of the time, who, who had cried, we have no king but Caesar, to the Lord's face. As a result, they had no firm foundation. And when the Roman armies came, like a flood, they were destroyed. And those Christians who had heard and who had obeyed the word of the Lord left and escaped. It's, it's just a matter of historical fact. Jesus predicted the circumstances of the destruction of Jerusalem, and those who heard his voice and obeyed escaped. And those who heard and did not do what he said did not. And he knew this, of course. He could predict the future because he is exactly who he says he was. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He is the eternal word of God which is what the last two verses touch on. The last two verses, it says, And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority, not as their scribes. Immediately, they were able to notice, what he's saying, no one else can say this. No one else has the authority to say this with such confidence and mean it and to have it happen. The reason Jesus can say, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock is because he can also truly say like he did in John 8. Before Abraham was, I am. And of course we know he's, he's quoting the voice of the burning bush that spoke to Moses. He says, that, that same covenant Yahweh is who is now speaking to you. And they said, no thanks. The words of a mere man could not give eternal life. Muhammad, Joseph Smith, Buddha, no eternal life. All are dead. They can't give eternal life. They're dead. Only Jesus Christ is the living God. He is the eternal word. He is the true word. In Acts chapter 4, Peter says this, he says, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. It's not we can be saved. It's like, yeah, he, there's him and then other options. We must be saved in Christ. It's Christ and it's him alone or it's chaos. If you need any more evidence of that, look around. Examine the fruits of any other way. See where it leads. It's Christ or chaos. So when we think about how to apply this passage to our lives, we're immediately confronted with the idea of, of what it means to build our lives on the rock. Because we don't want our lives to be built on sand. That won't work. If we see it around us, it won't work. We need to build our lives on the rock, the word of God. Ephesians chapter 2, which we read in Sunday school, it's kind of cool, spells this out for us. It says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Christ is the cornerstone. He's, he's, you know, in the old times, the, the cornerstone was what the entire building was measured off of. And then the foundation is the apostles, it's the New Testament, and the prophets, that's the Old Testament. He is what gives the, the authority and the certainty to the foundation, which is the word of God. And that's what our life is built on. Isn't that amazing? Paul's a good writer. <laughs> on the unchanging 
That's the key word. The, the, the authority of the scriptures does not change. That's why they're written. On the unchanging authority of God's word, we build on top of that. God, through us, builds a beautiful temple on top of that. And he's been building for 2,000 years. And we can see some of the fruits around us. You know, you look at the, uh, all of the hospitals around. Almost all of the major hospital uh, lines were, were founded by Christians. All of the advances of modern medicine that have saved millions of lives all started by Christians. 90 plus percent Christians and the founding fathers of almost every field of science. The world has received countless blessings through the church. And we're being built up, most importantly, as a temple for the Holy Spirit. You think back into the Old Testament and how terrifying it was when the Shekinah glory of the Lord came down in a pillar of fire and everyone was terrified. Or, or when Nadab and Abihu offered strange fire and instantly were consumed by the presence of God's Spirit. That now dwells in you if you are in Christ. That's how radical the message of the gospel and of the New Testament is. That's why people went, wait, what are you saying, Jesus? That it's only through his blood, it's only through his sacrifice, that when God sees us, he no longer sees our sin, he sees the pure righteousness of Christ. He has wiped our record clean, and his Holy Spirit can dwell within us. So when we hear the words of Christ, when we act on them, when we allow them to transform our lives, we take part in the furthering and the building of that kingdom. And so when we think about how to apply this to our lives, I think it has four main kind of global uh, levels of application. Individual, familial, ecclesiastical, and civil. And so we're just going to kind of look at those for a minute. On the individual level, as we think of how to build our lives on the rock, there ought to be a distinct change in our lives from when we first became a Christian to now and going on into the future. That doesn't mean we will be perfect by any means, but the direction of our lives ought to be pointed towards Christ. The direction of our lives ought to be pointed upward. There, we should be a stark contrast to the world. We should be an, an antithesis to the world growing in humility and wisdom and joy that's contagious and overflowing. We have the truth and the promise that the world cannot understand. We ought to be overflowing with joy because of that. And when the floods of life come, we don't respond with, with bitterness and complaining like the world does. But instead, we follow the example of our cornerstone, you know, his apostles. We maintain love and peace and joy despite whatever circumstances come our way. And so that manifests itself individually first, and then on a familial level. There ought to be a distinct difference between Christian and secular families. The family identity of the Christian family is anchored in the Word of God. Where the families of the world are known for fighting, for bitterness, for divorce, for separation, the Christian family is overflowing with joy, with unity, with blessings from God, just like that. With eternal security families of this world cannot grasp. And then on an ecclesiastical level, on a church level, there ought to be a difference between a church that is one in name only and a true church of people who have been purchased by Christ Jesus. True churches are those that are founded on Christ's word. They hear the word of God and then they do and teach what he says. Not what they feel like, but what he says. We assemble faithfully because he says so. We partake of the supper because he says so. We preach the word because he says so. We give because he says so. We study because he says so. We have purposeful, joyous fellowship because he say, says so. And we take this all seriously because he says so. There's great emphasis placed on what Christ says. We do that and that alone we don't make up stuff that's one of the key differences between a true church and a church that's not founded on the word of god when you come into a true church wherever it may be what you should see and hear are the words of jesus christ heard spoken and acted out nothing else Finally, when we think of this on a civil level, 
only a nation founded on biblical principles can, can yield any true human flourishing. John Adams, one of our founding fathers, once said, Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Our constitutional republic, with its balance of powers between state and federal authority, it cannot function if the people that comprise that nation are not submitted to the authority of God's word. It won't work. Our government cannot make wise decisions if it neglects the word of God and just establishes whatever laws it feels like, whatever laws the populace wants. We saw how well that worked in the early 20th century with Nazi Germany, with communist China, with communist the Soviet Union. It did not work. And there was, uh, I'm, I'm fond of pointing out, this is exactly what Nietzsche said. Nietzsche wasn't a Christian by any means. But during the late 1800s, he says, you know, God is dead, we have killed him. And many people kind of misunderstand what he was saying there. But what he meant was that humanity had said, okay, you know, uh, we don't need the, the old, outdated values of, of the Bible anymore. We have our own values. And what he predicted was that the 20th century would see more bloodshed than every other century combined as humanity tried to create its own system of values. And would you look at that? He was right. Read what Hitler wrote about creating the Ubermensch and the, the Superman and the pure race. That's what happens. That's what happens when we reject the authority of God's word. When we try to create a system of values that comes from our own heart. The Bible tells you where exactly your own heart is apart from Christ. Deceitful and wicked. And so the governments that come out of that are also deceitful and wicked. So in all these spheres, the authority of Christ made known through the writings of his prophets, the writings of his apostles, must be our highest standard in all of these spheres of authorities. Because the floods aren't just coming sometime off in the future. The floods are here now. It is raining. It is, it is pouring. There is great wickedness coming against us in our society. And any structure not founded on the word of God will not withstand it. And when that happens, all that will remain will be the people, the families, the churches, and, and the civil structures founded on the word of God. And with them, a bunch of broken and soaking wet people who've just been hit with a flood. And we have to be ready to give them an answer to why we believe what we believe and why we're still standing when they're not. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The church of Jesus Christ will outlast and overcome all its hellish enemies because God himself has ordained it. He's spoken it. And so we must be ready to welcome those defeated enemies into the kingdom because that's who we all once were too. Let's pray.